All right, Big Fist Society, we've got the privilege of talking to Mr. Jeff Carpenter from the great state of North Carolina tonight. How's it going, Jeff? Good. I was just laughing a little bit about that Mr. thing. Jeff works just fine. <laughs> Mr. makes me feel real old, Jeremiah. Mr. Carpenter is my father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Hey, you, are, you are in a cool part of uh, North Carolina. You're out in uh, the western part near Cherokee in the Great Smoky Mountains, and you got all that cool stuff going on. And just to give a little background about you, and we'll hear much more later, but uh, you're with the BFRO, you're with the KBRO, which is a Kentucky Bigfoot Research Organization, and uh, you've got some other uh, another group you're in, but we'll hear about that later. But uh, how's it going tonight out there, Jeff? It's going good, a little better than the first time we tried. I think we both were having some electrical storms going on last week, but uh, doing great. Uh, Jeremiah, I live in a uh, little background. I live in Sill, North Carolina. That's S-Y-L-V-A. It's right near Cherokee, North Carolina, where most people know because of the casino now and the Smokies. We're just right outside. I'm about 10 miles out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in western North Carolina and uh, uh, lived here. My family's been here uh, in western North Carolina since the early, late 1700s, probably. And uh, we have a rich, I like to talk about a little bit, if it's okay, about my Appalachian history and when we were talking on the phone it was really neat to hear that your you and your dad both had read the Foxfire books and I like to tell people my family uh, are just uh, Appalachian people that grew up right outside of uh, Clayton Georgia on the North Carolina line in Otto North Carolina and they were my grandfather Harley Carpenter uh, and I think you might have a picture of Papa there uh, he was uh, one of the first people interviewed for the Foxfire book series and later on, they made a play out of the book. And yeah, that's Papa telling the telling the tale there. He uh, he was uh, definitely a mountain man for sure, and loved uh, a lot of things. You know, there he uh, he uh, uh, was one of the first people again interviewed for the Foxfire books. And my great aunt Ari Carpenter, uh, by marriage, uh, was the person they made the movie about with John Denver and Hugh Crone and Jessica Tandy. She played Aunt Ari Carpenter, and that's on the cover of the first book, uh, I think, that you said you have there. Oh, was there a movie about it, too? Yeah, it was made as a really? Hallmark movie. Yeah. Uh, the whole gist of the story, which is really uh, impactful nowadays, is, you know, they didn't. her husband had died, and uh, she was uh, there. Her son, which was John Deere, was trying to get her to sell her mountain property and moved down to outside of Atlanta. And she just didn't want to do that, you know. And she lived uh, in a little cabin, little cabin type thing. And I, I'm just very proud of my mountain heritage. And I bring this up in all my presentations because I do want people to understand where I'm from and my family, my background, because it's a little different. I had a, a great upbringing by my parents. Now they were very country. Some people would call my family's uh, dirt people, which is a derogatory mark in my mind, but they're Appalachian mountain people. And there's my father, uh, Irvin Carpenter. Uh, he was just, uh, it's hard for me to talk about my dad. He's been passed away about 30 years now. And I gave you that picture because he's really proud in that when he won the biggest gobbler co contest in 1981. But that was a, uh, daddy was a mountains man mountain man now he uh uh they've written stories about my dad his nickname was old high top uh he just loved the mountains more than anybody ever met and i grew up i think i went raccoon hunting the first time when i was maybe six years old or five with my dad so i'm very comfortable being out in the woods of a night in the dark and uh, daddy helped by the way give you a a little tidbit there, Jeremiah, he helped restock the turkey back uh, in Western North Carolina through the Wild Turkey Federation. They were about gone. Papa used to call them mud hens. <laughs> that was one of his nicknames for them. But, uh, and grew up learning how to call them with a briar leaf and things like that. But uh, I always tell people, Appalachian people, uh, you know, were looked down upon. A lot of it's because of the movies and things. But uh, they were probably the most resourceful people. You know, they in my opinion, invented recycling. Like my grandfather on both sides never would throw away a nail because it was hard to get come by. The reason I bring all this up, though, to kind of cut short here is to people understand my background is my father raised me. He was a master tracker. And uh, again, I, we ginseng hunt, 
deer hunt, raccoon hunt, fish. But we just would just spend a lot of time in the woods. And, uh, you know, he taught me about looking at tracking sign. It's not a, the big things you look for. It's the subtle things that you try to find, you know, that type of thing. And uh, he was just the best. He raised a lot of other guys besides me and my brother out in the woods. And uh, uh, he was just a real special person and I always paid tribute to dad. Uh, he kind of got me here. I'll never forget, Jeremiah, real quick, like we were sitting in a place called Deer Cove, and hopefully some of your listeners might know where that's at if they're in Macon County, North Carolina, but it's a real remote place. We were ginseng hunting, sitting on a ridge, and I'll never forget, Dad was sitting over on a log away from me, just doing that far away look, you know, which I always kind of dreaded when I was a kid, because that means we're going to go walking over that next ridge, <laughs> and uh, there's no flat land where we live at, and uh, he just said, you know, Jeff, you need to listen to the woods or the mountains. Sometimes they got something to say. And I found that very uh, prophetic now, kind of what I've gotten into, you know? So uh, I don't think he ever had any strange sightings. He never mentioned to him, but he did see mountain lions. He's seen two mountain lions in his life and which is a very rare thing to see here. I know people say they're not here, but they do cruise through the area. Sometimes I do believe, and I've seen tracks, but I've not actually seen one, but one of the things, though, is Appalachian people uh, telling the truth is a big thing, as you probably know, just the way we're raised and uh, lying's kind of a sin, uh, pretty much. And it's just uh, you're supposed to be straightforward and truthful to people and, and honest, that type of thing. And I always kind of preface that because the things I'll tell people are actually what happened uh, word for word, sighting for sighting what I heard, what I heard. It's just who I am. And, uh, it's been very successful for me for what I do, but this is what I am. And also my background to tell people that's listening, I was a parks and recreation director for about 28 years. I worked for Jackson County, North Carolina for 32 years and I'm a parks and recreation back, a graduate from Western Carolina university. And one of the first people in my family to graduate from college. So really proud of that. And that's a lot of my dad's doing again. And, uh, you know, he was just very much about education and learning things, but he taught me a lot about the woods that you just can't, you just can't get any other way. If that makes sense. I think that makes uh, total sense. A lot of that, um, that knowledge about the woods, uh, especially from that area, you're not going to find in a book. But if you do, it's in the Foxfire books. You know, as you had alluded to, you know, my, my, I guess you could say my father was a naturalist uh, slash camp director and he had those books. And just the, the info in those books are, were just incredible. You know, I read them when I was about 10, but it was my first uh, introduction to to the ways of uh, Appalachia, Appalachia, even though we lived up in the Northeast. And uh, it's just cool. Uh, listeners, I'll have the links in the show notes. They're cool books if you can find them. Uh, they're they kind of hard to find nowadays. They're very hard really. to find, yeah. Um, and by the way, there's a museum in Dillard, Georgia, Jeremiah, if you're ever down this way. And if you are, I appreciate you holler at me. I'll kind of take you around. But there is a museum there that's really neat for people to see. It's in Dillard, Georgia. It's the official Foxfire Museum. You know, oh, right. wow. Yeah, totally. I'll put that on the on the uh, the trip list because uh, we'll get over there eventually for Expedition Bigfoot uh, Museum. So, uh, I wanted to real quick like explain to people about our area that we live in. Jeremiah, absolutely. Again, I live near the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and uh, you know, years ago, I, you know, I didn't really think about Bigfoot a lot. I seen the film, but you know, that was kind of thing out in northwest. You know. It's kind of cool, you know, but just didn't really think about it being here at all. But one thing a lot of people don't know about is how much public land we have in Western North Carolina. I just want to give your listeners a, a little stat. Everybody thinks about the Smokies, but the Smokies is really basically the smallest, one of the smallest that we have. So, and these are all connected, Jeremiah. They're all connected. There's Pisgah National Forest. I'm going to look at my notes if you don't mind, so I'll get the numbers right. Pisgah National Forest this is near Asheville is 512,000 acres. Then we have the Natahala National Forest, which by the way, in Cherokee means land of the noonday sun. It has 531,000 acres. And then we have Chattahoochee National Forest, which is kind of North Carolina, Georgia kind of 
you know, kind of goes across two or three states. That's 866,000 acres. And then the Smokies has 522,000 acres, a little more than that. So you have 2,432,000 acres that's connected. That's public land. Wow. And that's how big an area it is. Uh, and people don't really look at it that way. They look at the Smokies and they just, I guess just don't really realize that they're all connected and it's a vast area. So what I'm getting at is a, a good friend of mine. I'll mention, I think you've interviewed him, Matt Pruitt. He's one of the better researchers you'll ever meet. Yeah. Great book yep. out, by the way. I'm uh, talking to him uh, this week about his book actually. So I'm, ex oh, I'm excited yeah. to talk to him again. Yeah. 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 Tell him I said, hello. And we mm -hmm. talked uh, once or twice a month, Matt got me into this stuff and I'll mention here in a minute, but, uh, it's uh, he's like Jeff. Why do you go other places? You got the best place and on the east for sure for to research in. And so I spend a lot of time here doing a lot of research. And I'm I'm more of a field researcher, Jeremiah. I, I like this is the way I grew up. And since I'm retired now, I've been retired about ten years. Uh, I get to spend a lot of time now. I'm just recovering, fully recovered now from my fifth knee surgery, but uh, from old college basketball injury, but. Uh, uh, it's a little setback this spring, but usually say last, I think it's last year or year before last, I camped 82 days, maybe, uh, doing research. And, uh, I just, I just like it. Most of the time I'm by myself and that sounds crazy. And that's not a good thing for the listeners to do. But again, I, I'm a little comfortable with that and I make sure everybody knows where I'm at. And I do like the, uh, idea of putting yourself out there a little bit, uh, where you're not a lot of people, if that makes sense you know so uh, uh but that's our area and it's again if people's not been to the western north carolina area it is very beautiful the smokies is the most visited uh park in the national park system and also a little stat for people that don't know it's also the most if i can get this right because it constantly changed here my it's the most biodiverse park in the national park system but also it had they're documenting the different species and this has been ongoing for years now i think they've documented nineteen thousand different species in the smokies and they think when they're finished it could be up to a hundred thousand different species of you know plant life animal life different things and it's just uh they found they find all kinds of salamanders all the time they're just a different species uh, it's a really interesting study there for sure such a diverse area and a, a wide area of land. Uh, there has got to be, and I already know the answer. To, I know because I've talked to people, but there is a history of Bigfoot in this area. That is intense. Um, yeah, for sure. Is that uh, anything that you could share about? Like how, oh yeah. how far does this Bigfoot uh, these reports and, and the legends go back in the history of North Carolina where you're at. And now Matt's documented some of those by doing research on newspapers. He can tell you even more, but uh, due to my lucky, I'm just the luckiest guy in the world. Sometimes things, sometimes I think something's guiding me to this kind of research. It's kind of weird, but uh, as a park director, I was over uh, Judicola Rock Project, which is a piece of county property that was donated to us, which is the largest petroglyph in the southeast. It, it's uh, it's it's great, and I think you have a picture of Judicola Rock there, and a drawing we had depicted of Judicola, which is actually Tutacola in Cherokee, which means slant-eyed giant keeper of the forest. And the Cherokees have yeah, that was an artist rendering. In the background is an actual picture taken years ago where they had done the, uh, uh, I guess it's kind of like, it's not spray pack, but chalk in the symbols. There's hundreds of symbols in, in this rock and even a, a copy of Judicola's uh, hand kind of type of thing. But Judicola was a big uh, uh, legend, if you may, uh, of the Cherokees. And he was a keeper of the forest which a lot of people have heard about uh, was your female. And then stone man was a big around, but uh, I guess an enemy of spear finger, but stone man, if you see stone man, you turn to stone. Now my interpretation of that Jeremiah would be, you go into shop pretty much. Uh, so, uh, and there's uh, also, I'm missing, uh, see other local legends, and it's not Cherokee, this would be more an uh, English legend back in the, the 1800s was Boojum, 
which is a local brewery now in Wangsville. But Boozham was a, a, a person that came into mining camps and would steal their food. And then there's also Hoot Nanny, uh, one of our famous authors here, John Paris. Uh, uh, he's passed away years ago, but he wrote about mountain stories. And Hoot Nanny was a legend in Haywood County near a place uh, near Laurel Ridge. There was a lodge there in the 1800s. And they would see this hairy wild woman it would come and whistle and hoot and that's where the term he says hoot nanny comes from although that's debatable you know because that means dancing too you know that type of thing but uh uh there's just a lot of uh, uh legends here locally uh of that you know that type of thing when you dig into it and there's a lot of stories that go i constantly get things that pop up out of the clear blue one was uh years ago uh a guy told me about his grandfather building the first train into Asheville. His great grandfather would talk about they had food being stolen in their logging camp. He was a logger and uh, they thought it was the campers getting in and sneaking the cook did. And they hired a person to come in. He said with dogs, uh, this is relayed by his grandson to me that, uh, and they shot it. And it was, uh, they said, uh, looked like a monkey with no tail. Now keep in mind, this was in the late 1800s. So they didn't know about gorillas in those days. So that I found that to be a fascinating report. And he told his family stories for years before he passed away. Uh, but there's a lot of older stuff in history in the mountains here. And uh, of course the Smokies has the mist. So there's, it makes it mysterious too. If that makes sense. Sometimes it's a very mysterious place. Did he say, so they just shot at it or did they actually, do you know if he they actually that, killed the creature? Or? He, uh, now I never met the man. This is a second hand sure. story, but yep. uh, he said it was shot and it was a smaller uh, monkey is what he would tell his family wow. without a tail. And this is a random story. A guy just riding a horse one day bumped into me and said, Hey, are you doing what I think you're doing? And I kind of said, you know, when you hear that as a researcher, like, uh Oh, here we go. Uh, but then uh, I found out he was akin to my wife. Uh, his cousin is, uh, distantly related to my wife's cousin. So it was somebody, now this guy was in Georgia when I was talking to him, but he was referring to an incident that happened to on what's called black mountain when they're building the, the railroad up to, uh, uh, Black Mountain in Nashville, North Carolina, you know, that type of thing. So, but that is Judicola there, a uh, the rendering of that. It was a great project. Uh, we worked with archaeologists on that project. I did for probably about four years and worked with the Eastern Rock Art Society and the Forest Service. And uh, it's a great, a mysterious thing. Uh, we've had a couple of TV shows, and I don't want to say which one. I was before I tired against them coming to film it because it went against the historical record that we had uncovered about the rock, uh, you know, how things can get changed a little bit or put into certain people's interpretations. But the county let them do it. So they've been two uh, documentaries plus numerous YouTube videos done at Judah Color Rock. And that's a J-U-D-C-U-L-L-A, Judah Color, is the English way of saying that. That is extremely interesting. And those those uh those legends and how they're they're woven into you know native american uh history it just it's just so fascinating how you know you can you can start to wonder you know how how much of that is is related to to bigfoot and sasquatch and i know on the you know on the pacific northwest uh you have a lot of that with the uh the the totem poles but um, I, that's it's, yep. that's something I didn't know with the Judicola Rock. That's very cool. I'm going to look more into that for sure. Thank you for yeah, sharing that. It's really cool. Yeah, they, uh, uh, you know, most myths are based in some form of reality, you know. And uh, real quick, like you'll hear me mention in just a minute about my son. He's a, an athlete. He's now a basketball recruiter for a school. And, and then my daughter has an interesting job. She's uh, older than my son, but she's my – 
anthropologist by degree and she's a zookeeper by trade and she works with gorillas and primates on a daily basis is what she does so i'm a little different than a lot of researchers i have heard about the ideas off of uh, it's tough for her since she works at the north carolina zoo she can't really comment publicly on things because they have to go through their media people but uh commissioner's very knowledgeable so i know a lot about primate behavior for sure you know because of her that would be a really interesting. Oh, I bet you have some really interesting conversations. That would be cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we do. I'll mention yeah. one here in a little bit. I don't know if she'll appreciate me mentioning it, but uh, it's a little theory she had about uh, uh, just, you know, Sasquatch, which I like better than Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot makes you think of just one. Right. Sasquatch is, makes you think of many kind of thing. And it's just a better name, I do believe. Uh, but, yeah, I've had two sightings, uh, uh, Jeremiah, that, uh, well, I guess I should tell you how I got into this. Absolutely, quick, right? yeah. And again, it starts with my kids. I'm, a, again, Parks and Rec Director, and your dad ran, a, I think you said, a summer camp, wasn't it, camp yep. director? So that you is know, true, being yeah. his son, how that works, you don't get to see him a lot. Oh, it, it's <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Working. It's a lot of fun, but it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, so as a recreation programmer and recreation director for 20-something years, I was working a lot, but my my son got up. My daughter never was interested in hunting and I've quit hunting just because I'm into this. And I don't know, it, it doesn't really fit my profile really good. I never was much of a, uh, uh, I, if I'm going to shoot something, I'm going to use it. You know, I, I just can't do that. I just always been my nature. And, uh, so I was taking my son. The very first thing that I noticed here was, uh, he was about 10 or 11. I just took him to the airport today. So we was trying to figure out it's been so long ago, He's uh be 30 this year. Uh, and my, I took him uh, to go deer scouting to teach him, you know, how to deer scout. And what it is, my dad had a little secret honey hole uh, down near a river there in our area. That was a, just a secret, good little place. And I was, we always put out salt blocks or apples, things like that, but we never hunted over it. If you know how that works. And, uh, so I took him and it is a heck of a walk down this really steep mountain into this little hole near the river, perfect little pocket area. And he was just tenderly, his wore out, not much interest in things. But as we were coming back up the ridge line, I don't know if you know about scouting, but you don't want to profile yourself on a ridge though. You want to kind of stay below the break of the ridge and just kind of look over the ridge. So I was trying to show him that and he was laying down the leaves He's like dead. I'm tired, you know, that type of thing. And I look down in this area <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a bowl. And that's where we usually hunted at. But the salt block was over behind us, kind of. And I looked down there and in the middle of this little area is a little opening. And there were two hemlocks, you know, probably about, if I can get the direction right, about, you know, yay big around. Uh -huh. And uh, I knew they were there. I just happened to notice that the tops were out of them. Well, me being me, I kind of get into things as you asked other researchers. I just walk off lots of times, leave people. I just took off down the hill because I thought there's a bow hunter and had my hunting spot because we had a stand in there. So we, and again, it's not at the salt block. It's over the ridge from it. So I go trumpsing down through there. I just leave William and it's just getting close to dark. You know, we get down there and I look up in these two big hemlocks, you know, about eight foot, I think I measured about eight foot four, both of them, and they're kind of growing together, kind of, you know, side by side, but there's nothing anywhere around them, they're close at all. The tops, when I got there, I was befuddled. They were twisted, twisted and peeled. The peel probably was at least two foot long, and I was just blown away. You could see the fibers in the, the tree, Jeremiah. It was just, I'd never seen anything like that. I've seen plenty of black bear. I see I think two years ago, I seen 17 black bear, you know, out researching and just goofing around. Uh, but they, you know, they'll climb a cherry tree and strip it, you know, and then go down to the bottom and eat the cherries off of it, you know, that type of thing. So I'm looking for the tops, right? Because I'm just befuddled. And Williams made it down there and he's laying the leaves again. He's like, Dad, you're stupid. They're underneath the tree. And there was both tops stuck point first underneath the tree. They were dead. Really? So I pull them out and I'm looking at them. I'd already checked a tree. You know, hemlocks have really thin branches. They're not really. So if something climbs it, you could tell it'd break it like a bear or something. And a raccoon couldn't have done it. The only thing possible could have been a black bear. Well, the tops had no bite marks on them. Nothing. 
absolute nut. Now I'm really befuddled. It's hit me that William's asking questions. I don't want to scare him because I want him to go back in the woods. You know, I'm like, what is going on? So I go back there a couple of weeks later and I find two more of these things and I'm really befuddled. So I start going online. This was again, I think, uh, 2004 maybe. And geez, I'm just befuddled. I'm doing all kinds of research now. And I've heard about Bigfoot. You could research it on the internet doing tree twists. And I'm like, what? There's no way that can be here in Western North Carolina. That's stupid. And, uh, then another time, me and him were uh, doing some scouting, and we came across this little spot. It's hard to describe. I hope I'm trying to describe things. I hope I'm doing a good job of putting pictures where people can imagine. But we were on old trail, and there's some barbed wires, and it was like a a little bit of a wet weather spring, Jeremiah, where water was seeping up. It's mm. kind of mossy, but I could tell again, subtle sign that something had went through there. It just barely broke some of those briars a little bit so i'd stop to show william and it was just about dark getting dark and dusky dark and we're close to the truck and he's like dude i don't want to go and i was like william something's been in here let's see what it is so i stepped in there once i got into that mossy wet weather area there it was as clean as day about a 15 and a half inch human-like footprint there were four of them i i didn't know what to think i was befuddled and my son's best friend played basketball. I won't mention his name because I hadn't asked to say his name. At North Carolina, he he's six foot eight. And his dad's six foot nine. He always has this really, you know, he has a large foot. And we didn't know how to refer. He said, Dad, that's bigger than my buddy's foot, you know. And I was like, he said, what is that? And I was like, uh, you know, I didn't want to scare him. There's no way it was a double track because, you know, I'm used to bear tracks and Dad was a bear hunter. You can tell there'll be a little break in that line of the track if that makes sense where you you might not see the toes but it, it won't make an even line if that absolutely makes sense yeah on edge. and mm -hmm. uh i was just I was like no way and then we went back over again uh growing up with my dad we'd do night rides a lot just to see wildlife when i was a kid so i've always done those so i started doing more of those and one night me and william was driving on a gravel road close to this spot uh, maybe four months later, five, and we hear the loudest howl you'll ever hear. I, we were driving with the wind is down and heard the howl. That's how loud it was. So we stopped and then it howled again. And of course, he figured out by then what was going on. He's like, Dad, is that a Bigfoot? What is that? And I said, well, it's not a coyote and it's not owl. And that's the way I kind of think to tell listeners out there. I try to, as much as I can, Jeremiah, debunk things because it doesn't make any sense to go to the to the least likely thing first, you want to go to the most obvious thing first and then try to work your way down to that, if that makes sense. But that's the way I got started. So years later, I come on a website, come up on a website, this guy in North Georgia. And I was like, hey, that sounds cool. I'll call a guy. And his name was Matt Pruitt. And uh, Matt, uh, he says it was two to three years. We have a constant argument about how long it took him to get me to come to one of these BFRO things because I was just like, I hate to say, I'm going to go out there with them crazy people, <laughs> you know, and uh, he finally talked me into it. And, I, and again, it was good timing because I was retiring in 2013 and and it was in my area. He wanted to do one. He wanted to use me as a resource and then as a, you know, a lead, you know, kind of a, you know, trail lead guy of a night. And, uh, and what was weird was when we were talking the first time, he said, hey, have you been to this such and such spot? And that was where I was having all this activity at. And I hadn't even mentioned it to him. It was just a weird coincidence. But me and Matt has become really close. And I know you've interviewed Matt and going to again, as you said. He's just a, a great resource and just a phenomenal. He studies stuff. It's amazing. And he's just a really good friend. Uh, uh, he lives, you know, out. So it's a little hard to get up with Matt. You know, uh, we still get together some. And, uh uh, and again, I was wrong about the, when I went there, I met a lot of people, biologists, people, uh, you know, all kinds of good researchers. It was a good thing. And after that night, that weekend, Matt wanted me to be a BFRO investigator. And so I started doing it. I'd been doing a little on my own for four or five years. And so I agreed to do it reluctantly, as you can tell, as I, or when you call me or got hold of me, I'm just, I kind of like to be in the shadows sometimes. It's just my way of being things. So, but Matt was a great resource and I do appreciate him, uh, getting me started on this kind of mystery and, 
and it led to again my first sighting in 2015 so i think you have a picture there of that uh somewhere yes let's see so that would be the is it the drawing uh, yeah, the artist rendering. Gotcha. And by the way, Jeremiah, that was done by two, a researcher, a good friend of mine, Sheila Johnson in Kentucky. Okay. Uh, she's kind of taking a little break from research, her and her husband, TJ, but Sheila had done some artwork. And the way this worked, again, like I mentioned, I like to take night rides and boy, I don't know. I got the best supportive wife in the world to <laughs> put up with me. But it was, uh, I think it was. Uh, June, I have a note here somewhere, June 23rd, I think, or it was June in 2015, and it was very green, but what it was is the waxing crescent moon, which is, you know, a good hunting moon, it was real clear night, and I was like, you know, it was like 10 o'clock at night here where I live, and this is research area where I saw it at was, well, actually, I wasn't in a research area, I was just driving to one, uh, is about 30 miles away. So I just said, Hey, I'm going to go out and ride tonight and see if I can hear something and make a little noise and take my recorders, which I do. And so I was going on up the road. Actually, I was listening to ACDC, which Charlie Raymond loves. If you know, Charlie with the Kentucky Bigfoot group, uh, he loves that store because he likes ACDC. And down at the bottom of the mountain, I see three deer, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. So I start slowing down, you know. And as I'm climbing up this mountain on Highway 64, I, I don't like to give out exact locations, Jeremiah. And I apologize to everybody about that. But it, there's a reason behind it. One is I like to keep an area fairly pure. Because if you get a lot of people in there making noise, you just don't know what's what, you know. And then also nowadays, there's a lot of people with thermal scopes, and they say they want to shoot one. Uh, and I just don't know. That's not a safe thing, if that makes sense. But it's Highway 64, and I was climbing up the mountain there. So I'd already slowed up. And as I come into what I call an S-turn, uh, going through this S-turn, I was only doing 20 mile an hour. And I see a coyote. And a coyote was not, it just struck me odd. I, he was on the right-hand side of the road. And I just about stopped. I let off the gas because I didn't know if he was going to run in front of me. But he wasn't looking at me. I'll never forget. He was not looking at me. He was looking across the road, which I thought was weird. He never looked at my truck. And so I just about stopped because I thought he might run in front of me. I didn't want to hit it. And then when I, I just kind of panned the way he was looking, and this is what I saw off the guard behind the guardrail. And it's very steep where this was at, so it's hard to tell the size of it. Uh, but that's what I saw, uh, and she did a good job on the drawing. It had one of his arms kind of uh, curled like that. And I will tell you, it didn't have fur. I got about a good three-second look because I just kind of coasted by and, I had audio running, so the audio is just that if I played it, you would laugh so crazy because all of a sudden I start talking to myself. It was just I couldn't believe what I saw. Again, a uh, no neck, a low, like a dome for a head. And again, one of the reasons from talking to my daughter is, you know, the jawline for some primates are below the shoulder. So from the back, it'll look like there's no neck. You know, they're not like our jawline, which is above the shoulders kind of thing. That's inc and, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, if you look at gorillas, you know, you'll see or chimps where their jawline is, particularly gorillas. And uh, it didn't have fur. That's an, a big thing. I always like to give people in my presentation the tips that I saw. It had hair, scraggly hair. This is June, so it's kind of hot. It did have some stuff in its hair. I remember seeing that, and I could definitely see the, the back line, you know, the spine line. And as she drawed there, I couldn't, it's such a quick glance at it, I couldn't see if it was gray hair or just kind of grayish light skin kind of it didn't move and i just coasted by i couldn't believe it i couldn't turn around real quick i had to go up and then i started trying to tell myself oh jeff you've seen a dead pine tree because this thing was like a burnt brown color you know how a dead white pine will look jeremiah and so i, I said okay that's what it was you're just jumping to conclusions you know which is kind of like confirmation bias you know you're going to look listen for something maybe you just thought you saw something. So I cruised back down, nothing. There's absolutely nothing there now. And I was like, holy cow. And I made some calls, coyotes bark, you know, of course there's a pack of coyotes because there's that one. Didn't, uh, didn't hear anything weird. Went back up. I spent about four hours. Our poor man, I called him at 1230 at night, just losing it, you know, and this is how great Matt is. And I keep complimenting him. 
he's going to pay me five dollars or something but uh, he immediately <laughs> said jeff just draw i mean i woke him up he's like jeff just start sketching and which was a great tip. So I felt like the guy from Close Encounters, you know, where he's building the Wyoming thing, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I must have 75 sketches here where I was drawing it. I couldn't figure out the arm for a while. Then it hit me that it just had it curled up. Uh, and uh, interesting tidbit on that. My 90, my mother passed away last year. She was two weeks away from being 100 years old. Mm. And uh, I'll never forget showing her this the first time about a year later because she kind of got interested in just watching shows and stuff. And like first time I showed her a cast from out west, she said, oh, that's not a human. It doesn't have an instep. This very, very matter of frank country rock, you know. And then when I showed her this, she said, what time of year was it? And I said, June. She said, oh, it might have had a baby in its arms. I didn't even think about that. Wow. That's an incredible observation thought. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a thought by her because that coyote was there. And I don't know. I did have uh, my friend, one of my best friends whose son played at North Carolina. He's six foot nine. He went there. I can't believe he did. It stood on the side of the road the next day. And I can't tell you the height, but I can tell you uh, it was way bigger than him width wise. Uh, is very broad and had a very athletic, if you notice, a narrow waist. Uh, but it was, it would definitely had to weigh it close to 400, 500 pounds, probably, probably around 400. It's, you know, people always underestimate or overestimate like bears here. You know, they say, oh, it's a 500 pound bear when most of the time it's 250 pound bear. Uh, and I do think that happens to Sasquatch a lot. Uh, but uh, it was incredibly sight. Uh, it was just an amazing thing. I'll never forget. Uh, uh, I said a little prayer cause I'm a very, uh, faith based person. And I just couldn't believe I, I knew I seen something very, very rare. And I hope to see it, another one. And what was really weird about this sighting, Larry Sidwell, I think you said you had interviewed Larry. Yeah, I talked to Larry. He's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah, he is. I couldn't do this report. He had to do it on me cause I'm an investigator, you know? So, uh, he uh did a report but what was weird is uh before this larry didn't know i had a sighting he calls me he's like jeff uh you've probably heard of the bfro database which is the flats we call it big database of possible sightings now a lot of them not being investigated but you know just there's just a bunch and uh, he said jeff there's a sighting close to you a guy had really not a sighting i should say uh that heard a, a howl and found some a track and the guy was on the Appalachian Trail uh, doing like a, you know, weekend hike around uh, this uh, national forest there at Ninehala. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's standing Indian National uh, or campground area. And uh, I talked to the guy. I didn't even tell Larry I had a sighting yet. And I told him later, but that happened four days after my sighting. And it's 4.5 miles from where I saw this at. So could be a weird coincidence or it could be the same one. Uh, they what did heard a howl of a night that woke them up. It was not a coyote. This guy raises Christmas trees. He, he has coyotes on his property up in, uh, the Virginia, North Carolina line all the time. He's a great witness. So, uh, the next morning they were going down the Appalachian trail and his buddy's boot heel come off. So they looked at the map and seen this little hidden trail is amazing. They, found it on a map and i know it real well because of dad and it goes down to the campground so they're trying to take a shortcut as they went down in this and if you'd imagine in smoky mountains or our area uh, this is outside of the smokies but it's we're a tempered rainforest just like out west so in june and july uh i got in there about july 4th where they were at uh the weeds are six seven foot tall in this area it's just crazy but they had found where something had went through the this trail and crossed and they followed it for a little bit and they started finding these big imprints and in, in the leaf matter and that's hard to find because you know the substrate dictates how you can find a track people don't realize that hooves animals are completely different flat-footed animals it's even hard to find bear tracks or people tracks you just can't but uh this was a kind of a wet area they were seeing that then they found some weird stuff like mushrooms that were picked but turned upside down sitting on a log near these tracks which is kind of wild and the guy was a great witness uh but it was wild that it was only four days after my sighting uh, and it's a good what i would call uh 
and I'm starting to give you information I don't really give before. Uh, I call them corridors. You know, uh, these things are constantly on the move. I wouldn't say they're nomadic, in my opinion. These are just my opinions, Jeremiah. But I would Absolutely. say they have a massive territory, though, and they're constantly moving because that's the only thing that makes sense. But that was my first sighting there. So uh, sorry to ramble so much there. But About your sighting, so I have two questions. Um, could you see any muscle definition underneath the hair? Any, I know uh, it's a few seconds, but just curious. That's a good question. I, I definitely could see some muscles in the sh shoulder area. I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember. And, and I definitely could see, uh, what's it called? Uh, I don't know the proper term for it, but you know, in the lower back area above the butt area, yep. uh, the indentations. And I will also notice when Cy sto stood there, you know how people's shoulders roll in kind of, yeah. I noticed it shoulders rolled in kind of at the, top of the shoulders but i did see muscle definition in the lower back for sure it was very muscular it i don't know if you remember the wrestler big bam vader that wrestled in the wwe for a long time he's had this ma massive oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah vader yeah, the mask. yeah totally but you remember yeah. how he, he had a thin waist that's the way this thing he this thing had some massive shoulders and then this really athletic looking waist it was phenomenal look it would just took me back I, I but you know like i mentioned to you before we started uh and i hope i can say this quote yeah i tell people when they ask me what happened you know it's a hell of a thing when a myth turns into reality and mm. your body i just i didn't realize till i went back in town like four hours later to all night walmart to get me something to drink oh i walked in the guy of course said welcome to walmart and then i realized i was drenched in sweat I had this crazy, my wife, when I called her, she said, what is wrong with you? It, I just had this reaction. And that's one thing I look for in good reports is the way I don't tell people, but I'm looking, it's hard to explain when you can't, you see something that's not really actually supposed to be there. So mm. it, it really, funny. it really affects the person, doesn't it? Oh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it kind of, yeah. Uh, you, you can't let it go. And then my second sighting real quick, like was from a East coast. That's a group. We have a researchers basically on the kind of Midwest East coast area, a great group at Charles Kimbrough and Lori Wade and some other people had starred Larry, uh, great people in there. And, uh, we got some reports about, uh, two fishermen on separate occasions that seen something at a, a state park in Virginia. So we went up there and, uh, real quick, like, uh, this sighting, uh, was just again, luck, but I was walking up to a group we'd been separated cause I like to do a little technique where I stay back behind people and listen. And a, a guy just started researching. who's a really good friend of mine now, a fellow researcher, George Wrigley was with me wanting to stay back. And we kept hearing some things, which I think was a separate one. But as we come close to the group, my cell phone went off. My wife had texted me, you know, how you can just randomly get, a me you know, a message signal, you know, and I was like, oh, no, because I didn't want anything light in my face that night. I wasn't even using thermals or anything, but the moon was out, and uh, Georgia went past the group, and the other two people were Rick Rellis. I don't think they'll mind me mentioning your name. He's a BFRO investigator. Rick's a great he's, guy. He's one you know of the first guys I talked to, like, yeah. four years ago. He's so good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great fella. And then uh, uh, Steve Poppleton, who's from Georgia, was with us. And uh, as I walked up the group, I looked up the ridge because one of the techniques Daddy always showed me hunting is you profile again the ridge line, especially on moonlit night, because you can see something move like an ear flip or something's bedded down. So I was looking for movement. But this wasn't on the ridge. It was below the ridge. I see this big, large, I thought it was a burnout stump. You know how I kept, I remember saying to myself, I don't remember there being a fire. People talking about a fire here. It was this dark thing. And it was pretty well lit up there. Not where you could see facial features, but you could see just something dark. So I'll uh, come up and Lori said, they like to call me Jeff Squatch. And that's another story from a different time in Kentucky. It's a funny story. If you read Charlie Raymond's book, it's in his book. Why they call me that. But, uh, and Georgia again, it went on. So, and she just said, Jeff Squatch, what's up? And I said, I oh, just sorry about my phone going off. And we were talking. I remember Rick was wrapping up his parabolic mic. And then we heard this sound. With, and we were like, George, is that you? And he 
directly on the audio. We didn't catch it because everything else happened after. George goes negative like this real quiet, you know, like, uh oh. And uh, well, I just told Lori, I said, Lori, I think that was George, you know. And then I just made eye contact. I looked up the ridge line again. It's kind of a gully, you know, kind of, it's kind of like this, going straight up very steep. And, you know, again, that stump was there. Well, when I made eye contact with it, I remember Rick was talking to Steve and putting up his parabolic, and he was kind of turning towards me. Uh, I see this arm come out, and he had hair hanging down. Now, keep in mind, I know bears real well. Bears can't do that kind of movement, you know, where your arm goes out like this. You know, they don't have clavicles, you know, they don't have shoulders, but they just can't do that. And it kind of took me off guard. And then I see a leg, and then it just takes off running astronomically fast. It's hard to describe how fast this was. And then Rick kind of sees it at the tail end of it because it goes kind of past my eyesight. There's a little knoll there. And he, because I say, uh, <laughs> sorry, a cuss word uh, that I do sometimes. And uh, I hate to do that because it startled me, you know. And the best way to describe what I saw was a, as a catcher in a squat. And he takes off running, but he don't stand up. He's just kind of leaning forward. Now, the movement, I've never seen, you know, again, I'm a basketball trainer. I train kids for basketball. I used to all, you know, for 40-something years. Uh, I know movements. Uh, and I see Bear. Bear, you know, can't do a smooth move, Jeremiah, where if they were squatted or standing up, it's more of a plop kind of, you know. They just can't control that if you ever seen that in a video. It's just weird. They can walk a little bit, but when they want to go down to four, it's just and this thing was on two feet, by the way, leaning. And one of Lyle Blackburn's books later on, I found a sketch that looks just like it. I forgot to send you a picture of that. Of course, I, you know, hadn't asked Lyle to use it, but it's more like what I saw. It was about leaning just about completely over, and it was so fast. But now it was slowly kind of standing up. I seen it maybe five steps. And then, of course, Rick saw it, and then we kind of lose it. Uh, but that was that sighting there, and it was a. Uh, phenomenal to see the movement uh that was something in all my years i've never seen anything move like that the only thing maybe i've seen accelerate that fast is when i used to go elk cut i've seen antelope out west that could accelerate that fast Man, wow that, that must have been really fast how how uh, long was the hair hanging down from the arms well it was about it was a debate and we had George go up there and run the next day, and it was just way bulkier than George. But uh, it's hard to tell. Again, it's nighttime, but I did see hair hanging out. But I would say two, three inches, good enough to tell they were hair there, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. in the moonlight. Maybe longer than that, but I definitely saw hair coming down. And the arm come out straight from the body, not forward, you know, from the body towards me. It was to the side. Okay. That floored me, you know. Uh, you know, that's only – People can only do that, you know. It's just not a normal movement for any wildlife you see. And again, the size of it, George, I think, weighed 200 pounds. He said in those days, <laughs> I'm getting him pretty good right now. I said those days, he might be a little more than that. But uh, it was just so much more bulkier than him. And I'm talking about the width of the thing. That's what I can't, everybody gets focused on height. I can't get off how wide and how strong these things are. They have to do a lot with their shoulders. They're probably on all fours a lot sometimes, you know, uh, or, you know, digging. Uh, they just, what I saw was very powerful both times. It was a fascinating thing. So hmm. that's my stories and I'm sticking to it. You know, that I'm loving the that, first, the first encounter I have to ask though, what AD, what ACDC song was playing when you saw the Bigfoot? Uh, before it, I'd cut it down when I saw the deer, oh, but okay. uh, uh, a little quieter because I'd roll the window down. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, because I, you know, might see some wildlife. And, right. Uh, I think it was a uh, Highway to Hell, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. All right, yeah. that works. You that sound works like you like ACDC. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you're if someone's going to make the movie of your sighting, they have to know what uh, uh, <laughs> you know. They have to know what song to play. So <laughs> uh, I hope you don't do that. Yeah, well. maybe they get Brad Pitt to play me. Uh, there not, you go. Yeah, you know, that'd be a bad interpretation <laughs> of me if they get Brad Pitt. But uh. that's that's funny. Hey, Jeff, what do we should play? Some of these sounds. What do you think? 
Yeah, that's one of the things I've All gotten right. into. Again, thanks to Mahonga Haley and uh, David Ellis and people, Charles Kimbrough. I've gotten into just, I love doing audio and we do long duration recorders. But the first one that I sent you there, the one it's, uh, I recorded, uh, uh, it's just hard to explain. I had this area and that's for another podcast probably because it's just, I've had so many things happen. But mm-hmm. I had an area where Lori was doing the expedition, Lori Wade, if you know Lori with the BFRO. She does great expeditions, by the way. And I was doing a field leader again. I had five people with me that never been in the woods of a night. We had a four pound rock thrown at us. I found the rock. Oh wow! Uh, it was crazy. So I kept going back to this area, having some things. I was working on Pavlov's theory, you know, where I and make one sound immediately leave. Well, this time I decided I'm going to aggravate George and Lori. So I went up to this little field uh, where we'd been having some activity and uh, uh, was trying to call them because there's a signal there. So I broke my pattern a little bit. And uh, uh, basically what you'll do is you'll hear me. I was, you know, texting them, hey, y'all are working and I'm just out here goofing off because I'm retired. I'm in the woods, you know. And, uh, of course, uh, I got them for a second, but I thought I heard something. And then you'll hear me walking a little bit. And then you hear a very clear wood knock. And then you hear me do what's called a descending whoop call, which they do a lot. And then you'll hear the reply. And I did amplify that reply, Jeremiah, just so in my presentations people can hear it better. All right, so I'm trying to I think remember that's what which 10, 29, one. 18, I think, or something like that. 10, something 18. Oh, okay, yep, yep, yep. All right, let's try this one. Yeah. yeah, this is it. Okay. You'll hear me walking. That's the wood knock. And then that's the reply I got back. Yep. <laughs> uh, I kind of cut it off. I did say a bad word at the end of that. Sorry, but I was just startled. <laughs> it sounded yeah. like a, a disembodied voice to me until, again, the good thing about audio, you know, it's hard to prove stuff with audio, but you can also just document better what you can hear. And sometimes, Jeremiah, you won't hear something, but there's actually something going on, too. It's just weird how that works. But uh, uh, I sent that to Mahonga Haley and uh, David out west. And right. uh there's a little bit of debate of whether it's one or two, but uh, uh, he thinks it's a triple whoop. I think it might be two. We put our, all our audio on Audacity, which is a probably when we can do a spectrograph and look at it in the hertz it's at. And it seems to me it might be another one kind of quietening down another one, like a younger one. But it mimicked me right back. And wow, I was just startled, to be honest. Uh, it was crazy. Uh, but audio is a good way to get involved in the research. Uh, it's very simple. Just keep your recorder with you. Uh, I use mine on my backpack. It's constantly running. I've learned my lesson. I uh, learned that from Turkey Hunt with dad. You can slam the door going Turkey Hunt and all of a sudden there's a gobbler real close. Like, uh-huh. In other words, you better cut that audio on right when you get out of the truck. You just don't know uh, the randomness of this stuff. It amazes me. Uh, and again, that's the way nature works. It's, there's not, you know, it's just random when you see things or hear things. And uh, there is another audio. I try to give your listeners a, a wide variety of things. And everybody focuses on the big house. The second one I'd like for you to play is a recording that it was given to me from another researcher. And uh, I can't give you the location, but as a hiker on Appalachian Trail years ago recorded this. This is the North Georgia vocals. Uh, I use this as a presentation. It has a, diff- a lot of different sounds in this one, Jeremiah. Okay. Yeah. 
hear the whoop. That is that's wild. It. So that's, you said it's North Georgia? Yeah, on the Appalachian Trail. He just happened to have a, a video recorder with him. He recorded that on a video recorder of a night. It woke him up. And there's, they do make, in my opinion, again, these are all my opinion and experiences, they make more subtle noises than they do the big loud ones. And the perfect example there of a whoop, uh, which is kind of like a gibbon will make. You know, it's a little Yeah, exactly. A whoop. It's a on, a, on a spectrograph, it'll look like a, a backslash. And I've heard that. Hard, yep. Yep. It's hard for people to really make that call the way they can control it. It's uh, very hard to duplicate it. And believe me, I practice at every red light. You know, I don't know what people think about me in another car, but I like to practice my calls. You know, uh, I think you do have to get them to interact, well, not interact, but react to noises sometimes to really know if they're in a location. Uh, although I, I will tell you, a lot of people confuse coyote calls with Bigfoot calls. And oh, they sure, are, yeah. I, I'm one of the rare people that's seen both together. They are and maybe symbiotic. In other words, one works off the other one, kind of. I don't know. They're not walking around like one on, got one on a leash or something like that. But you know what I'm talking about? Maybe one makes a kill, the other one comes in and robs from the other one, kind of. Mm -hmm. There's tons of things in nature that are symbiotic, you know, and oh, yeah. people don't know that term. That's the little bird that's sitting on the back of the, the rhino or whatever, you know, he's eating all the bugs off the rhino kind of thing. But uh, so they'll confuse calls. And I encourage anybody who wants to get in research, you got to know your sounds. Uh, and there are a lot of good sound labs. Uh, you know, Cornell University has a great one, has ever known mammal bird sound. Uh, but to really, you got to eliminate the the obvious things first. But there's not many things that are here that make that whoop sound. I can tell you that for sure, you know. And then I, I don't know if the howl I sent you will play really good. I'm trying to remember what I sent you there, Jeremiah. There, I recorded it in the Smokies uh, back last fall. Just luckily, we're talking about, I think it was a bobcat we saw on the thermal and then our other researchers walking up and then behind us on a ridge where there's nothing, this howl comes from. All right, we'll, we'll see if this is the right one here. Those guys are coming. Yeah, that's right. It's been great seeing it. Cheer. Yeah, it's, it's faint in the background. Probably if they have headphones, they can hear it, but probably if they don't have headphones. But it's a, it's definitely a how. I've, again, we try to vet everything. It's pretty good and send it to multiple people. Uh, one of the things you'll notice with the howls, the good howls, is the way they end, you know. And Mong Haley can explain that better because he's an expert in the field. But they, they it will end with the, I guess it would be like the ooh sound kind of thing or ah sound. Like uh, I have a little cheat sheet here I can tell you. It's like a, uh, the ooh would be like mop. And then the, the other sound that canines can't make is the boot sound, if that makes sense, the double O oh, sound. Okay, interesting, yeah. So if you notice at the end of the North Georgia uh, louder sound, you'll hear the ah oh, kind of thing. Canines can't make that sound at all. And, oh, that's cool. Uh, and then also duration is a big thing because canines usually are very, except for wolves, you know, of course, there's we have red wolves in North Carolina, but they're down on the coast. But uh, uh, and they're not like uh, the gray wolves, you know, up north. But they can howl longer and do different sounds. And there is an audio I didn't send you, but it's on YouTube. The uh, St. Louis County, Minnesota sounds that was recorded by a BFRO investigator for like he had an LDR out, long duration recorder, and it lasts for close to forty minutes. We'll start them off, but again, something comes closer in. It makes what's called a zipper call, which is just like a whistle, you know, the whistle thing you use in the band. Yeah. Ooh, it, it's this crazy sound. I don't know what can make that. But, but it, it sounds like a zipper. Yeah. yeah oh, it's boy. like woo, whoop, like that real quick. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's I've a, also heard of an actual like Bigfoot making a, a zipper type well, noise as well. And they can do that. Uh, and they do do that, but keep in mind, I did debunk some years ago because it happened to me. And then I thought I had one, then I realized what it was, is a, a bug flying by my mics. Oh, interesting. Yep. Okay. By. But huh. they do make a zipper call, though. 
And then, you know, the, the whoop calls are like gibbons. If you know, mm-hmm. again, my daughter, uh, she listens to these and she said, dad, that's gibbon. You know, that's like a, uh, it, it's, you know, fascinating sounds, but the audio is a good way to document things. And I, I thoroughly in, enjoy doing that, uh, Jeremiah, you know, for my own purposes, my whole thing as an investigator uh, is to document things. I've been working now really hard. This spring's been tough since the knee surgery, but uh, to get quality evidence. And I'm just really doing that to turn it over to somebody like my daughter in the future. Uh, everybody wants me to work on a book and I might do that, but I'm more, my goal is 10 to 11 years of documenting things. And then uh, I have a uh, probably right now about what I'd call, and it's the first time I really talked about it publicly, about 85 data points in my area that I consider very credible witness reports, sightings of mine or other people's or good audio occurrences. And I've tossed a lot that's not in there, but uh, I will tell you, they do fit a little bit of a, a corridor kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating in our area is we have a lot of man-made lakes. If you know anything about Western North Carolina, Fontana is our biggest, which is right near the Smokies. But there's way more than that, and in Georgia. So uh, uh, not to let the cat out of the bag a little bit, but uh, those lakes force things to go places, if that makes sense. So, oh, I totally get it, yeah. And I'll hopefully talk more about it, but I want to have in the future just way more documentation and more thought into it than just throwing something out in the Bigfoot world is a very skeptical place, as you know, and, uh, and the, you know, and it's just human nature with people. Uh, you know, most of the reports I get, I'd say 75 to 80% are misidentifications. Uh, maybe somebody just wanting to be famous, whatever, but it's like Dr. Krantz used to say, Grover Krantz, the famous anthropologist that, uh, it only takes one track to be re- real, to make it real. You know, uh, so 20% of those, in my opinion, that I've worked on have been real things. And uh, and again, I, I just uh, two weeks ago had a contractor here in our area stop me in Ingalls. In fact, he was so animated. we were, I was in a checkout line and he's a family friend of mine. I've known him for 50 something years. And he said, Jeff, I got to tell you something. You still do that that stuff? You know, it's funny how those, that stuff. Right, exactly, <laughs> it's not like it's yeah. a taboo word to say. Yeah. But he said, uh, he was working by himself in a real remote area, building a retaining wall, and got off his backhoe and heard a wood knock sound. And he don't really believe in this stuff, and he didn't know what to think. It startled him. It's so loud. And he turned around and looked in rhododendron, and he seen its head and shoulders in this rhododendron patch looking at him. And then when he made eye contact, it popped back down and was gone. It freaked him out really bad. I mean, he'd been looking for me for about three or four months to find me to, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, you could just tell this guy had seen something. It was just, he was just animated. And he's 60 something years old, you know. Wow. Yeah. Again, equipment, by the way, Jeremiah, I've had some experiences where heavy equipment's been left and they're in the area. I don't know if it's curiosity. You know, that happened, in, you know, was it Bluff Creek, Willow Creek? Oh, sure. Yeah. Know, exactly, building yeah. log roads. But yeah. Like uh, when we got, I think there's one other audio there that's a wood knock I sent you. Uh, if you want to play that, that's a, but there's a motor grader parked there where we parked that night. To, it's a great example of a wood knock. I think it says Waya, W A Y A H, which means yep. wolf in Cherokee. Okay. Here we go. You hear it sound like a baseball bat. That was it stopped now. us in our tracks. We'd been out all night, didn't have anything happening with my good friend researcher, George Wrigley, and his son. And I really wanted his son to experience something. He'd never, in fact, we're walking towards this old cabin at four o'clock in the morning. I just wasn't going to stop. Again, I'm a, I get that way. I just won't keep going. And we'd had some, I'd found a track there and a bow hunter had sent me a, a report real close to there. He'd seen one bow hunting and, uh, so I said, let's go down to the old cabin. I remember Alec going, uh, Jeff, I'd just rather there'd be a, a Bigfoot here than this. This is scary. It's like a ghost could be here. And then that wood knock happened right when we got close and it stopped us in a track. And we kind of messed up and went around this cabin 
Hurley trying to cut it off, and it ended up what I think. I could hear it in the leaves crawling. I think it dropped down all fours, but I would call that a sentinel kind of thing because I think they do that sometimes while the family group's feeding. They'll have one on a lookout kind of, and they won't do that until you get really close to something or they get agitated, but there's no, there's nothing. I put an LDR there for four months and only heard one other wood knock like that. I could hear acorns hitting the cabin. I heard all kinds of stuff, but nothing that, you know how that was Chris, Jeremiah, it just sounded like a baseball bat hitting a ball. Yeah, definitely not, not an acorn. I mean, that's, that's, that was very, very distinct. Yeah. And it has force behind it, you know, in a Christmas. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they do that. I do think sometimes they'll do a mouth clack, which is sounds like a wood knock, yep. but it's not. But and then it could do a chest slap too. Uh, I think Rick Rellis tonight we had the siding had heard a chest slap right before I'd walked up to him there. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he had his parabolic out, you know, that type of thing. So, uh, but that's you know, audio is a great thing to do there. Uh, it, and it does uh, document some unknown sounds that biologists can't explain, and uh, uh, you know, and and it's just kind of fun too, to be honest, to listen to those recorders kind of like put you there of a night and you don't have to be there. Uh, it is, you know, one thing, Jeremiah, about this stuff, research, and a tr- you know, there are people that want to be researchers, but they like, and I hate to say this, pretend to be researchers, but to do true research or documentation of data and things like that it is one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I'm retired. This is incredibly hard. I tell people it's like looking for a, hay, a needle in a haystack, but a haystack moves around constantly, it, you know, and to get, you know, something like a crisp wood knock sound, not a tap, not a limb break, and not an acorn falling, not a, uh, uh, what's it called up uh, your way, the hedge apple falling, you know. Oh, yeah. Them things, <laughs> right, you know, they're, right, right, they're yeah. huge, you know, when they fall. Yeah. Uh, so, but again, I think what's important to new people getting into this is you need to know the sounds. Now, keep in mind, I grew up raccoon hunting with my dad of a night with a lantern, and that was it, and night sounds. So from age five to probably 14 or 15 when I got into high school sports and was too busy, I did that all the time. I just loved it to go with my dad. It was uh, kind of, you know, he's kind of like, I don't know, a superhero walking around in the dark, you know. Uh, but these were places he grew up as a kid, you know. And my grandfather had a, uh, and my great-grandfather had a hunting. Uh, well, before they were national parks here, they let them free-range cattle and pigs. Uh, mineral co- companies own the rights to massive tracts of property. But you could apply and free-range you know, what you wanted to raise. And they would do that, but they had a remote cabin way back in uh, Standing Indian uh, National, or Nine Haiti National Park. And Daddy and his brother was, would walk, walk in the supplies when they were just kids and then walk back of a night with lanterns. So he knew this area where I'm talking about and had my first sighting by the back of his hand. So I have a big advantage there. But, and then knowing the night sounds, and I still, I studied. You know, tonight's a pretty night. I might end up riding. I've, we got the Blue Ridge Parkway here. I might go up and go to a few overlooks and just sit and listen, you know. and uh, It's just a really neat thing that I enjoy to do, you know. And, uh, uh, and I stumbled in on this, and thanks to Matt Pruitt, I'll throw that in there in case he listens to this. <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> I, said, I think it's really cool how you have that uh... – that uh, friendship with with Matt Pruitt. That's that's very cool. I uh, I would say so. You know, ending ending out our our discussion uh, together. And, and Jeff, thank you for hanging out tonight. But um, probably a question you may have gotten before. But thinking of of the Sasquatch, what do you think it is that we are are dealing with out there? Have you come to grips with it's probably more this type of thing rather than another thing. Or do you have any thoughts about that? Well, that's the loaded question, isn't it? It is. It yeah. always pops up. <laughs> uh, I love it. And by the way, you do a great job. But uh, We've just kind of met this past few months. And uh, yeah. I've listened to some of your podcasts. I really appreciate the way you approach things. And, and even asking that question is a good one. Uh, 
Uh, I will tell you, I can't remember who was it. Is it Grover Kratz or somebody? You can't answer a, a solve a mystery with another mystery. You can't. Mm. So I, I tend to be more on the, uh, you know, and I'm open minded. I've seen some weird things out in the woods, and you will weird lights and uh, things like I told you when we were talking on the phone, you know, kind of debunk. And I've seen what my mother called mineral lights or spirit lights. These are oh, yeah. like the brown mountain lights. I've seen yeah. two of those. They're weird. But I don't see how people make cool. Let's say, example, they see a weird light in the sky, but then they see a Bigfoot later. What makes you think they're anywhere connected at all? You know, you can't do that. You're just, you know, you just can't do that. And I'm more, I try to be more, I guess, scientific based or just fact based. I'm going to. Sure. Uh, uh, but what I saw, particularly uh, the first time and then saw move was very uh, primate like. I should say that now that goes into all kinds of territories. People always say, well, Jeff, you know, I'm not an ape. Well, you are a primate. And then the religion thing pops up, but I don't, Jeremiah get into, uh, I think one of the problems humans have is we want to try to uh, be God. Does that make sense? Mm. And we're not, we're actually, what's that? There's a term anthro, uh, morphism, anthropomorphism, if I'm saying it right, which is a Greek term that means, uh, we that we were taught by the Greeks, they taught that we're over nature, over things, sure. and actually we're just a part of nature, is what it is. And uh, here lately, I think a lot of people's got that kind of thrown in their face a little bit. We are, we could die out, and the world's still going to go around. So what I saw was definitely a living creature. Mm. Now uh, I don't know, and it was upright, very muscular. Uh, it was not an apparition. Let me tell you, I'll, you'll go through. Did I see an apparition? Did I see something time playing itself? You'll go through all of these things in a true sighting. It is amazing. I had a young lady uh, report a sighting. It's, it's not posted on BFRO yet, but when I called her, and it's been a year and a half ago, she started crying. And she couldn't even talk at work. She had to go outside to her car. She was just, it was such an emotional experience for her to see yeah. this thing. And it is, it's just, uh, but I do think it's a living, breathing form of a primate. I've heard noises. I've, I've heard them and I've got documentation of them walking. And that was at Standing Stone in Tennessee where Mary Green uh, did a lot of research. If you know who Mary Green was and, uh, uh, it, it's either, it was either that, you know, on the spectrograph, Jeremiah, you can tell if it's bipedal by the lines, you know, cause a quadrupedal shuffle kind of, you know, and, uh, this was definitely bipedal. I'm sitting in pitch dark. It's walking. And another researcher with, uh, Kentucky and BFR, Jack Smarr, who's a great guy. He likes to take a Tom Tom and I knew he was going to do that. So I'd snuck off from the group. I really believe to get a, a a perimeter area about 200 yards keep in mind these things can hear probably really really good so they're coming close but not as close as you think until they feel more comfortable they just want to kind of figure out what's going on so i'm trying to you know get out there and listen and i heard this and it was definitely it steps over a log you can hear it taking a longer step oh wow uh i was beside myself because if i cut my light on and it's standing in the road it was up above me on a, in the leaves is how i could hear it I would have just passed out, you know, cause there's this thing, but it's, it was either that or a person. And it's more creepy that it's a person <laughs> that's walking around in the dark oh, in sure, the middle of yeah. nowhere. I mean, that's kind of weird, but uh, I do think to answer your question, I, I, it's uh, some form of a primate that I saw, uh, particularly the movement that I saw run. It looked very ape-like and I get to mm. see gorillas a lot. So I'll see how they move. Oh, yeah. This move more like a chimp would move kind of, but fast like that, you know, not lumbering like a gorilla, it, it, it got gone. And I think it was a juvenile and the rock clack we heard was a warning that it got out and open because Lori saw it come down the ridge and stop. And she, she was afraid to say anything. I forgot to mention that. She just thought she was seeing things. And then when we talked about it later, she said, I did see something move. I just thought it was, I was seeing things. So I think it was a juvenile that got out in the open a little too mm. much. And that's what that rock clack was for. And when I broke the audio down, you can hear a little bit. I think I have four recordings now and you have to really listen to them with headphones, but it's like a nervous tick. You'll hear a whine kind of like, you know, like a dog will do sometimes. Oh, like wow. A, yeah. Right. 
kind of thing. And you can hear that very faintly. And another time when we had a, a tree pushed over uh, and I walked up to an area and I could hear something moving. I heard a little bit of a, a mumble. Now, not talking, but a, just, you know, a noise and then a whine kind of thing. Uh, now, of course, bears can make different sounds, too, but they make more of a huffing sound. And, and then if you're, you know, on sightings, if people see an upright bear to tell you, you know, their ears will be on top, no clavicles. So when they stand up, they look like an A. Is the way that there's no shoulders. Uh -huh. There's no shoulders at all in a bear. Yeah. They just don't have clavicles. And so, and then you'll see ears on top of the head. That's telltale things for people, you know, to see. Now, lots of times people will see different angles, so it looks different. You know, and misidentifications is a big thing in this, but keep in mind it only takes one credible thing, like Dr. Krantz said, for it to be a real thing. And, uh, Exactly. And, and exactly. by the way, just a little shout out for Dr. Meldrum. I don't know if you heard he had an incident oh, happen on the cruise, and I hope he's doing well. He's. A I hope guy. he's doing good too. We're we're kind of all waiting to to hear the the news about how yeah. that is. But yeah, that Standing Stone State Park comes up more often than not on this show. It's yeah. weird, man. Like that area, there's there's something going on because it comes up over and over on my show yeah, it it's is very interesting so yeah and a lot of it's due to mary green's great research and uh, sure by the way uh, matt knows new mary i don't know if you know that uh and uh, he can talk a lot about mary uh if he will you know i don't know if he'd want to do that and he's saying sure. because he's talking about his book but he uh he knows a lot about that and she did some great research there oh, and wow. spent a lot of time uh document things and again if you ever go there it's a small state park but there is a lot of there's a national there's a forest around it too which is totally different uh you know uh it's not you know there's two different places name wise so it's a bigger area than what most people think and there is water there lakes and a lot of little tributaries and mm -hmm. it is what i in my opinion a great uh corridor a good transition area where they kind of move through sometimes you know, again, if these things stay in one cove as big as they are, Jeremiah, you're going, after a while, you're going to see five of them. They would just mat everything right. down yeah. weed wise. It's just yeah. common sense, you know. Uh, so they're con constantly probably moving and foraging what's going on. But uh, uh, it's a great thing. And I encourage people out there, if they've never been into an expedition or been out, I know you've been out sometimes. You know, I think I've seen you've been out here recently. It's just a yeah. neat <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, uh, two times in Iowa. Yeah. Um, oh, in it, Iowa. Been, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm from uh, central Iowa, so that's, that's where we, we go out. It, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I hope to maybe get your what my son's moved to Wisconsin now. He's up near Waukesha, oh, yeah. where Les Paul's from. Okay. Uh, they are working now. He just flew back today, him and his girlfriend. But uh hopefully I get up here. I'm gonna be up in Ohio working uh the uh Susan Fairchalks uh and Matt Moneymaker, the drone yep. thing there. Yep. Uh and Very then nice. I'll got a private thing doing can uh Ohio to in Kentucky and I've been up to Ohio spoke at B Mills. I don't know if you've interviewed B, but B's I haven't great. yet, but I, I, I know of Jeremiah. Mills, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. She's very good in her festival. I think the first year was last year and I spoke there. We had 12,000 people at the festival mm -hmm. this year. They had 42,000 people show up. That was Hawking Hills, but, right? Hawking Hills. Yep. It's great. Holy, that great 42,000. I think 41, 42,000. That's estimated. wild, man. I you think know, they I did that, that from drone actually. footage. Wow. Yeah, and B, it, she does a great job with that, but yeah. uh, she has some great audio by the way too, and just some okay. good track finds. But uh, yeah, it's a, and like I said, I was wrong about my first trip into this. There's some great people in this. I've met some mm. who just off the charts, uh, great people and very knowledgeable and they do a lot of work in it. And I think lots of times the research gets misinterpreted and, you know, you got a lot of couch people out there that, you know, want to, right. You know, I encourage people to get out and experience things for yourself, like a, a sunrise or, you know, go out and experience, uh, you know, uh, a, a starlit night, you know, a moonlit night, go out in the woods and, you know, go with credible people, be safe with it. But it is a, a great experience. And then if you can get lucky and have something happen, it's really unique, you know. Uh, but they are a real living thing.
Absolutely. Uh, I know that for a fact, for sure. I agree with you there. Uh, Jeff, it has been such a fascinating conversation. Uh, you're you're one of those guys I feel like I could I could chat with forever, but I thank you for coming on. Uh, well, it thank has you, been Jeremiah, for the a impact. fun one. Um, it, is there a way that, you know, let's say someone was listening to this and they're like, oh man, he mentioned this area. I, I had something that happened in that area. Um, is there a way people can contact you or do you kind of just keep under the radar uh, with this? They stuff? can post stuff on the BFRO site. All you know, right. But if you're not comfortable with that, they can send me an email at, uh, Jeff Carpenter 16 at yahoo.com. Cool. And I check my air. E- email there i prefer not giving out my phone number uh yeah. i get more of my reports jeremiah just by word of mouth people contacting me you know hey you're the bigfoot guy kind of thing uh yeah. and it, i'm amazed at how many people particularly professional people like a policeman i've had park rangers they won't talk about things until they're really retired and oh yeah uh, i've had some good reports from uh, I could go on and on about different things. And hopefully in the future we can do another one. I'd like to talk to you about what I call the orange incident that happened at the bait station. It, it would take a whole episode. Talking All about right. It. Yeah. Well, Hey, uh, it, it's a, it sounds it's a good to me. I'll, but, uh, I'll be in touch, uh, but uh, yeah, they can contact me there. And I, I do encourage people. I do think a lot of people don't do reports because they feel like, they would be labeled crazy, you know, kind of thing, or they just mm-hmm. won't file it away. Or yeah. sometimes maybe their memory is a repressed memory. I found in my talk, if people will talk about things, it's kind of like uh, the girl I was talking about, young lady. After a while, she said, Jeff, this has been therapeutic. I've kind of got this off my shoulders. I, I feel so much better. Lot, they kind of yeah. have post-traumatic stress disorder. Kind Absolutely. Of Absolutely. It, it's a, uh, it's, uh, you know, of course, Dr. John Bearcheck, if you know, Dr. John, he's a psychologist. Mm-hmm. And we talk a lot about that. I, I was at his first expedition and helped him out a lot. He's a great guy, but his specialty is post-traumatic stress disorder. So they do, after they talk about it, they feel so much better uh, because it's such a weird thing to them that they saw it's, Kind of like if you see Jesus walking down the road, he's just, wow, you know, Jesus was a real thing, but he just, it's just hard it's, to imagine. It's a little it, different when you see him on the road. Yeah. Well, yo, know, I'm just saying, yeah. or Santa Claus or something. You're just or, like, yeah, exactly. wow, yeah. there's Santa Claus, you know, it's yep. just, uh, uh, but it is a real thing. And it, I have to emphasize to a lot of people, it was very hard for me to come out publicly, mm. uh, the library here while we do a presentation. And I, I thought I'd have 30 people come and I had 200 and right 250 people show up. My goodness. <laughs> oh, it was, this is year, it's 2019 years ago. I couldn't believe wow. it. I, and I had a lot of Cherokee people come and had some sightings and, you know, some of them were kind of questionable sightings. Other people would say, but some of them were very good. And I followed up and then of course I had a park ranger show up. He wouldn't give mm. me his name, but they had some uh, things and that led to a sighting a couple years later that a lady had and I was following the area and she got a hold of me uh, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And it was right where these rangers two years before that had said, Hey, you need to keep an eye on that place. We're having some weird stuff happening. Oh, wow. Uh, and mostly noises. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, again, uh, that's probably, I hate giving out information when they don't approve me doing that. Oh, you know? I, yeah, so I, I totally get I that. I want yeah. people to understand when I'm yep. kind of, and I'm reluctant to talk about locations just because of purity and safety, if that makes sense. Uh, yep. Purity for my research, because, again, I'm documenting a lot of stuff. I want to make sure I can, you know, not have 10 people doing Bigfoot calls in an area that I'm trying to, you know, narrow something down. You know, it's kind of hard. Luckily, oh, yeah. we don't have many roads in western North Carolina, so <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot. So it's one way in, one way out. Jeremiah. Hey, there you but, go. Thank you again for the oh, offer. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, and you do a great job, and good luck with your your podcast. It's I, I love your logo, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, shout out yeah. to Jonathan Dawes for, for doing that for me. But, uh, Jeff, thanks so much for coming Thank on, you. sir. You have a good night.